Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Parent University Paying for College FAFSA 101, or Free Application for Federal Student Aid. My name is Jerry Elar, the Public Events and Engagement Coordinator at DC Public Schools. And we're so excited to start our college strand for Parent University. And so we have a couple of our college and career, career um, colleagues here to lead the presentation today. So as we get started, I do want to flag some upcoming Parent University workshops for October. For next week, we have College Admissions 101. For the following, or in the next two weeks, supporting students to and through college, and then for October 22nd, bullying prevention. And we know that term two is coming up for November, November 9th. We will have some engagement going on for Reopen Strong for term two. And so once we have all the information to present to you all, we will be adding more engagement events, both parent university workshops and panels for you to attend and information sessions for the month of October to make sure that you feel fully prepared going into term two, starting on November 9th. But to sign up for any of these parent university workshops for the month of October, go ahead, click on bit or go to your web browser and click bit.ly um, backslash DCPS parent URSVP and that will lead you to our Eventbrite to sign up for any of our parent university workshops. And then if you need access to subtitles or interpretation, we do have interpretation in Spanish provided today. And so we have a DCPS colleague and interpreters on that side. I believe it is um, bit.ly bit .ly, um, DCPS Espanol, I believe. Uh, and that should be in the comment box. But if you need access to additional subtitles, whether it's English, Chinese, Spanish, Spanish, French, um, and Vietnamese. There is a gear icon in the bottom right corner. If you click on that gear icon and then click captions or subtitles, you can change your subtitles to whatever language you prefer to use for today. And then for using the Q&A function, if you have any trouble throughout the session today or if you have a question or comment, there is a Q&A box at the bottom right, and you can ask a question sharing your name and info or ask anonymously. And we do have a couple of people on our side answering questions throughout the entire process and through the entire session. And so just give us some time and grace because um, we're trying to answer as many questions that are coming through as fast as possible. And so we will answer the questions through the Q&A, and we will also do that through the Q&A session live. And then if you have any other issues with using Teams for today, you can go ahead, email parentu at k12.dc.gov. And we have started, so for some people that have been logged in for a couple of minutes, it may take a while for Teams to start the video. So it might be helpful to log in and out of the team session, just to make sure that the session is going for you. And then, we want to talk about the community agreement. And so as we enter this space on both sides, both from DCPS central office and then from the from attendees like you joining today, we want to assume best intentions going into the session today. Go hard on ideas and not on people and then also also to accept non closure. Um, there may be some questions that we may might not be able to answer, but we're hoping to provide you with as many resources um, and information as possible throughout this session. With that, I want to uh, turn it over to Karime. Uh, uh, Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I am the Karime, the director of college prep programs at DCPS. And it is my pleasure to be talking to you all um, with October 1st here on what you need to do and know about and around financial aid, um, which is typically one of the biggest um, factors when looking at colleges for admissions. As a parent, you may be wondering, how am I going to afford paying for college? What do I need to do? And when do I need to do it by? And that's what we hope to address today. So our objectives for the presentation 
are to understand the different types of financial aid. So we want to introduce you to some terminology and bring you up to speed with the timeline for financial aid. We also want to explain to you how financial aid is calculated, both on the federal side and at each college. And we also want to expose you to opportunities um, in regards to scholarship search resources and our very own scholarship newsletter if you already not sign up for it. So to go ahead and get started, I want to first address some financial aid myths uh, that in my experience I've encountered when supporting students. I actually joined DCPS uh, back in October after working in undergraduate admissions at various institutions, most recently at a school here in DC. And I was always I have always been surprised by, you know, the question around do I have to apply for financial aid? if my parents make too much money. And I would say that is definitely a myth about financial aid um, because the reality is that as you are applying for financial aid, there is no income cutoff to qualify for federal student aid. And also the way in which scholarships are given at the college level, sometimes those scholarships don't have an income cutoff. So it is important that you consider applying for financial aid in order to receive the best financial aid package as your child is applying to go to college. The next myth would be the financial aid form is too hard to fill out. I've heard this FAFSA, the name FAFSA, and I don't know what that means, and I feel that it's difficult. I will say the form can be a long and a long process and it could be challenging to fill out, but it's definitely not hard or impossible. The financial aid um, form has been made available both through a mobile application and through a web and through the FAFSA.gov website. And it's actually way easier to apply for financial aid now than 10, 15 years ago when I was in college. Um, and we also at DCPS have a lot of resources available for you and your child as you get ready to start the process. The last myth that I will mention is only students with good grades get financial aid. In regards to financial aid, high school grades are important for getting into college but your grades do not factor when the federal government calculates um, your financial need. And so don't be discouraged. You should still apply for financial aid, but also know that as you enter college, your grades will matter in college at, in order to continue to receive financial aid. And so that is something that it is important to know, but it factors in once you are in college. And so what is FAFSA? FAFSA is a free application for federal student aid. This is the application that the Department of Ed has developed in order to award financial aid for students pursuing a post-secondary pathway, whether that is enrolling applying and enrolling at a college, a two-year institution, a technical school, or any other type of um, post-secondary pathway that requires students to fill out the FAFSA. The FAFSA form, um, as I mentioned, stands for Free Application for Student Aid. It is free. You should not be paying anyone or any website to fill out the FAFSA. The form actually opened today. Uh, congratulations, you are already here, one step ahead than many other parents. At DCPS, we want students to apply for FAFSA and we encourage students to apply and begin the FAFSA process as early as today. There will be help um, at your schools through your school counselors, your college and career coordinators, 
uh, and any and even help from us in the college prep team around how to fill out the FAFSA in addition to this workshop. But we want you to know that it is a process that takes time and that's why we encourage you to start becoming familiar with the application and to submit your application as soon as possible. We also want you to apply early because after you apply for financial aid, you will then receive um, your student aid report. And that student aid report is what is utilized um, to it's, it's what's utilized, excuse me, to um, determine the financial need that you will have in regards to going to college. So what do you need to do to prepare for the FAFSA, to prepare in order of filling out the FAFSA? You wanna make sure that you know your social security number, yours and your parents. Um, that is information that will be asked of you. And so if you don't know your social security number, you wanna make sure that you have that handy when you get ready to start the application. Um, children's US citizens uh, or permanent residents are able, the, the student itself is able to apply for FAFSA even if the parents are not US citizens or permanent residents. In this case, the child will just fill out their social security number and not and leave the section blank or enter zeros for the parents if the parents do not have a social security number. But if the parents and the students have social security numbers, those numbers will need to be entered. You also want to make sure that you have your tax returns available, last year's tax returns. You will be asked questions around income, earnings, assets, the number of family members, the number of family currently in college. And so the tax, your tax returns will be able to provide answers to those questions that you will be asked during the FAFSA, during the FAFSA process. And if you have any assets or um, additional income, you will also want to make sure that you have that information readily available as the FAFSA application will ask you questions around that. You can begin the FAFSA process, as I mentioned, as early as today, and every college will have different priority deadlines by when they would recommend that you submit your FAFSA. So really, ideally, anytime between now and January, you would want to make sure that you begin the FAFSA process with your child and submit, meaning complete the actual FAFSA, in order to qualify for the most amount of money that each college will be able to give. The next slide is the slide um, on FSA ID. FSA ID is the username and the password combination that it's used through the FAFSA website to electronically sign your form once it's ready to be submitted. As a student, you would want to create your own FAF, your own FSA ID, and you can actually create your FSA ID today. And if you are uh, the parent, uh, you would also want to create your own FSA ID. As I mentioned in my previous slide, you, if you are a parent without a social security number, but your child does have a security, a social security number, your child can still fill out the FAFSA and the parent will not be able to request an FSA ID. Instead, you will want to fill out a parent signature page that gets printed and then sends and, it, and then it gets sent, sent over. So if you are a parent without a social security number, again, just know that for you, you will not need to do an FSA ID, but all of our other parents will need to. And I just wanted to clarify that. Um, should anyone in the room need that information? So what do you need to know about the FAFSA? Your eligibility, how much money you receive, is it's contingent on the information that you submit as part of your application. The FAFSA 
is submit, it's done every year, um, starting with a senior year in high school and every year in college. And this is because if your finances change from year to year, the federal government makes this assessment and the college makes the assessment on a year to year basis. So that if one year your family's income drastically changes, the college that you're attending can factor that in in order to award you potentially more financial aid. And so that is why the FAFSA process is done every year. And, you, and, and as I mentioned, you want to have your FSA ID, the parent and the student. And also the earlier, the better. This is why we're doing the session today. Later on in the month, we are also going to be launching a text messaging campaign to remind parents and students of the importance of filling out the FAFSA. And we will also be offering um, virtual office hours where you'll be able to connect with one of us in the college prep team and other volunteers if you have any questions around the FAFSA once you begin filling out the application. So stay tuned for that information. Now the timeline. It is important to know uh, that the FAFSA process takes time both to complete it and also to hear back from the college. So the first step is um, filing and, and obtaining your FSA ID, as I already mentioned, and submitting the FAFSA application itself. Once the application is submitted, the Department of Ed processes your information and the student receives, as I mentioned, the student aid report. When the student receives this report, then colleges, the colleges that you list on the form. So as you fill out your FAFSA, one of the very last questions that a student will be asked is to list up to, I believe, 10 colleges that are that the student is interested in um, sending their information to. And so ideally you would you would list the colleges that you are thinking about applying to. And so as soon as you receive your student aid report, the colleges that you list or that you listed um, would receive this information as well. And based on that assessment, based on that information, colleges then review the report and I'll put together a package that is known as a, an award letter or your financial aid award letter. From there, the student is given a time to review their award package, compare their offers, and eventually accept any or all of the financial aid that has been given to them. And just to kind of put things into perspective, like for in, into months, for example, if you were to begin the process today and you were to, for example, submit your application, your FAFSA application approximately around November or December, colleges, depending on the college's deadline, they may start communicating with you around your financial aid as soon as your application for admissions is submitted or given their own particular timeline. So at a college where an admissions decision or an admissions deadline is January, they will typically start communicating with families about their financial aid around March. And that is generally speaking. And then once you are re once you receive your financial aid letter, you typically are given the month of the rest of March and April to review and award your financial aid package so that by May you would ultimately decide what college you are planning to attend and ideally you're attending a college that is also going to give you a pretty generous financial aid package. And that is just a, a timeline, a general timeline, but it will depend on the college that you are applying to and it will depend on the college's admissions timeline. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next couple of slides. Now, 
how does the federal government calculate financial aid? So based on your um, family's income and based on the information that you submit, the federal government comes out with a formula that it's known as the cost of attendance minus the expected family contribution is what is this is a family's financial need. So for example, um, you may be interested in attending a college that costs $50,000, for example, and that is the college's cost of attendance minus your expected family contribution or also known as EFC. That is based on the results that your student aid report generates. So that may mean that your family, based on your family's income, you may have the ability to pay $5,000 towards the cost of that college. And so in this case, that student aid report will indicate what your expected family contribution is. And you can think about it from the context of this formula. If a cost, if a college cost $50,000 minus the $5,000 that you're able to contribute towards your college education based again on this federal assessment, then your financial need would be $45,000. And then that ends up being the $45,000 that that college that you're interested in enrolling, attending would then offer you a financial aid package that would ideally cover, if not all of the $45,000, the majority of the $5,000, the $45,000. And again, this is just an introduction. So in the next couple of slides, we're going to uh, dive deeper into this formula. I want you all to also know the difference between uh, the different types of financial aid programs. So as part of the financial aid package that you can expect to receive from colleges, there are three main categories that are um, assessed by the federal government. That is grants or free money, loans uh, in order to help you pay um, for your towards your college education, that is borrowed money. So money that you will have to pay back um, to the federal government at some point upon college graduation. So you don't pay your loans while you are in college necessarily, but it is borrowed money. So it is important that families understand that at some point that amount that is borrowed will need to get paid back. And then the third type of federal student aid is work study, which is earned money or earned income. And that's based on colleges ability to offer employment uh, of students while they are attending in colleges while they're attending college. And that may be um, being an office aid at a, on a college campus that may me, that may mean working at on a college campus Starbucks. There are different types of employment opportunities depending on the college that you end up attending. Um, but in order to qualify or in order to earn your work study money, you would actually have to get that job on campus. I'm going to stop right there because I just gave a lot of uh, perhaps new terminology, uh, new information to some of you all. And we're going to start transitioning to how um, your financial aid is calculated in the context of college and college admissions. So I want to see if there are any questions um, for me right now. Are there any, Jerry? Yeah, we actually yeah, have a couple of questions, couple of questions. Um, for you, Karime. So the one is. Great actually um, a couple of general questions with parent, two parent households or um, two family households. Um, the main question around that is what if one parent has a tax return and one of them doesn't? How do you file for um, FASA? Yes, so in general terms, 
the parent that claims the child in the tax return is the parent whose tax information would be utilized um, when filling out the FAFSA if the other parent doesn't claim the child. If the parents are separated, um, the parent that has primary custody of the child would fill out or the income of that parent would be the income that it's used on the FAFSA. And then the non-custodial parent will still submit additional information. Um, this is typically done at the college level. The college would typically um, ask for a form that is known as the non-custodial paperwork or form or verification and that information would also be assessed. Um, so even though a parent may not have full custody of a child, that parent's income can also factor in. Awesome. Um, there was also one question a parent had through the Eventbrite thinking about COVID and the impacts of COVID with unemployment. How does unemployment of a parent or both parents impact financial aid for a student for this coming year and also just generally thinking how will COVID impact financial aid for this year? Absolutely. I mean, I would say the best way that I can answer that question is that it, the impact, it will depend on college by college, but it will not negatively impact your child if that is what you are worried about. Um, when I worked in college admissions, jokingly but seriously i would often tell students you know applying to college should not like your worry for not being able to pay for college should not keep you from applying and attending college right and so if a parent is worried about their um how they're going to pay for college because they've recently um, been let go or because of unemployment. The college's financial aid office, the federal government, have systems in place to ensure that the child that is going to college receives the best financial aid package available in order to make college attainable for that student. Um, and so being unemployed does not negatively impact the student. Um, if anything, if there is a greater need, that greater greater need should um, be reflected on the student's award letter. And again, like circumstances change anytime you should be updating your records with the FAFSA if you are still working on your application or once it's submitted, you should also be updating the college that you're planning to enroll with any update, updated information in that regard so that they can have the best um, representation of your family's ability to pay for college. And I know that the FAFSA in itself can be confusing to fill out. So I will just like, if I could just maybe clarify, the FAFSA itself, it's a, it's a federal form and it mostly asks um, questions around the family income and the family's ability to pay um, for college. So it will ask you questions such as, what is uh, what what is your gross income? Um, how many family members are under your household? Uh, are there any children in college? Uh, do you qualify for free or reduced lunch? So the federal government will ask these questions. And so it is a form that um, you should be doing alongside your child um, because your your student may not have all of the answers to those questions. Your, your child may come to you and say, mom, dad, whoever their legal guardian may be, uh, I need a copy of your tax returns to do my FAFSA. Uh, and they may ask for a copy of that because they um, they might be getting help from someone at their school to fill out their information, um, but it is sensitive information. So if you're not comfortable sharing your, your forms, your copy of your records, just um, 
spend some time to do this form alongside alongside your child and don't wait until the last minute to do it. Awesome, thank you, Karime. I think we're gonna move forward to the next section um, and then we'll have more time for Q&A in the last later part of the presentation. Great. So the next, so we're going to, as I mentioned, we're going to transition to learn to get a deeper dive on um, how is a financial aid review process in the context of college and college admissions. So before I pass it on to my co-presenter, I am going to introduce um, two more uh, words or terms that you may or may not be familiar with. This is in the context of college admissions. So I want you all parents to know that um, there are institutions who utilize financial need as part of their admissions process. And so as you are considering colleges for admissions, um, you, two questions that you could ask um, a college or find out on their website is whether a college is need blind or need aware. A college that is need blind is a college that for admissions purposes, only for the purpose of admissions, they do not factor in the family's ability to pay for college when deciding who gets in and who doesn't get in. A college that is need aware is a college that considers the finances of a of a student of an applicant in their admissions process. Uh, this means that uh, if a college may not have the scholarship or the financial aid to support you they may decide to not admit you into that college because they don't want to they don't want to force you or uh they don't want to make ensure they don't want to incur uh add excuse me add uh, more debt than what they should and so a school that is need aware is not necessarily a, a bad school. In fact, I previously worked at um, almost all need aware colleges. And um, what is important to know about need aware colleges is that these are also the colleges that um, can offer 100% of your demonstrated need um, because they are able to select who gets admitted into the process, and they know going in to the into the admissions process, they know um, the students that need the most financial aid. And if that is a student that they are interested in admitting, then that usually accompany, accompanies an admissions letter and a financial aid letter that will make attending that college um, attainable. And so Need blind, again, is a college that does not factor in um, your ability to pay to go to college in their admissions process. And a need aware college is a college that the admissions office can factor in your ability to pay for college um, as they select who gets admitted and who doesn't. So I'm going to pass it on uh, to my co-presenter. I am so glad that she agreed uh, to present alongside uh, us today. And so my colleague uh, Martha Molina from Trinity Washington, uh, I'm going to pass it on to you. And Martha, if you could introduce yourself to us and to the group, that would be great. Yes, good evening. My name is Martha Molina, the Director of Financial Aid at Trinity Washington University here in Washington, D.C. And I'm very grateful and very honored to be here with you and share some information concerning financial aid. Financial aid, it's, it is, sounds more complicated than what it is, but it's pretty much information that you yourself have. It's your own information, so it's we just review it just to make sure everything is okay. And 
OK, so. Where we left it. And and if I may, I think I just want to make sure. That I'm starting on the types of, of financial aid, correct, Karime? That is correct. Oh, OK, all right. Um, OK, so for your type of financial aid. Um, and again, financial aid is just based on your income. Um, something that I want to make sure that you you all know is that is your income how many people in your household? Right now we are in 2020, so it's been two years oh, for your income. You're going to use your income for 2018. So right now we are in 2020, almost you know a year. And depending on when you apply, maybe a little bit more. So schools can make a decision if, for example, you used to have certain income and your income has decreased on 2020 because of COVID, because of any reasons. You need to check with your financial aid office to make sure how do you go about correcting that income, letting them know that this is not the right income. Uh, for whatever happened on, from 2018 to now. So going back to the slide, you see the types of financial aid. We have two types, the needs-based financial aid and a merit-based financial aid. So your need-based financial aid is provided based on your family financial situation and how many people are in your household. How many people do you or your parents provide more than half of their financial support? So you maybe living with your grandma or grandpa, you may be. So those people, if they're being supportive by your parents, they will count on the household. So again, so as you fill out your FASA, be very careful and read those questions again. And if you have any questions or you're not sure, you can contact the school. You can even contact the FASA. They have a, a support number where they will help you clarify those questions. And usually in the FASA, you will see instructions as to what do they mean by the question that they're asking you. So what are the required forms? Are you FASA? Sometimes you have the CSS profile, depending on the school, uh, tax documents, and other forms. If you do not have a tax document, do not worry about it. Not everybody is required to file a tax. Some people are not required based on their income, based on the type of income. So again, if any questions, consult your school. Also consult your uh, the FASA support number that you will have on the FASA page. Uh, one more thing I want to say about the FASA is that make sure that when you are that when you go is FASA that you know GOV or that EDGOV that's that the the address. Don't go to FASA.com. A lot of students made a mistake because they just remember the word FASA and they put that come. But that FASA.com is not a federal page. They will charge you $50 or so if you do it. So just be careful about that. OK, so then you also have your merit based financial aid, which is to provide for reasons other than the family financial situation. Maybe academic merit, maybe because you're living in certain area. So the financial aid for your school will know what to award you at the time and if anything has changed on your FASA from the, the time or from the, the you started the FASA now you move make sure your school is aware of that because that way they can see if they can help you in any other way any changes of income on household if your income decreases if your household is higher um, things like that can help you okay and we can move to the next slide as well. OK, so how do colleges calculate financial aid? So first, colleges use this information provided in the FASA and potentially the profile that you that you some schools ask you to to complete. So that profile is basically information you already have. You can put on your FASA. One thing I do want to tell you is that you have up to 10 schools to put in the FASA, as Karimi explained, but the schools are not going to see those schools. So if you put our school, for example, Trinity, and then five more schools, we only are going to see that you input Trinity, even though you may have input more, enter more schools. So that way, 
you don't have to worry if you put all these schools or not. But it does help you compare what every school is offering for you so you can make the best decision uh, for you. So, and every school also have different methods of not processing. Processing is just one way, but of making what is called professional judgment. What I asked, what I mentioned before about income, your income decreases or, you know, and then they can do, then every school makes their own policies as to how they process that information. So it's also good, don't think because the school told you, no, there's nothing they can do, another school is not gonna be able to do it for you. So you just need to ask, okay? So going back to the slide, it's talking about the schools, the information that you enter in the profile, your tax docs, documents that you use, they determine your family ability to pay for college. So the figure they come up with is usually called the estimated family contribution. They do not expect you to pay that money. They just figure in that if they look at how much you pay for rent or utilities or transportation, personal, that's what your family can contribute towards your whole expenses, not towards your school expenses only. So what is step two says, once you know your EFC, your estimated family contribution from the total cost of attendance, and your cost of attendance is called also a budget. That's where you put how much we believe an average student or the parents are gonna be paying for housing, for room and board, transportation, any other expenses. Uh, you, you take federal loans, uh, loan fees, um, books. So this is called a budget and this is called the cost of attendance, okay? That's where the EFC and that's how we calculate tuition costs as well, um, how you calculate what you need, what is called your financial need. We can move to the next slide, please. So examples of college costs of financial need will be, for example, in this case, if the financial need is 60,000, your scholarships are 10,000, we take into account institutional grants, federal grants, state grants, loans, so it's a total of $40,000. So this is saying that if your financial need is 60,000 and your total aid is 40,000, you still have an unmet need of 20,000. And why is this important? Because just because we award you funding, that's not all you can receive. You can also get scholarships on your own. You can get, you know, apply for private scholarship and get more funding but the school can only award you up to the cost of attendance. So many students are able to get some scholarships and they're able to reduce their loans because they don't need those loans because they uh, obtain more, uh, more grants and different types of scholarships as well. Could we please move to the next slide? So now we come to the award letter. And what the slide says is exactly what it is. You do not have to accept the whole amount offer. You know, make sure to accept anything that is free, like grants, scholarships, your Pell Grant. And having sent a Pell Grant, there is another grant that is available that is based on the FASA and it's a federal grant. It's called the Student Education Opportunity Grant, it's a COG. So what this grant does, and this is why as Kirby was saying early that you need to file your FASA early because there are some grants that are based on not so much in need, but also it is based on need, I'm sorry, but it's also based on you obtaining those funds while the school has them available. The SEOG grant, for example, it is a grant that is limited. They only give some certain money to the schools and the schools put the other part of the money. It's not like the Pell Grant that they have, you know, a lot of money. Usually, I've never seen the Pell, the Pell Grant, you know, coming short, but I do see the SEOG sometimes, they exhaust the fund. So the fund that the school is eligible to receive. So it is important that you file your FASA, your FASA early, that you complete your admissions process early as well. And then when you're talking to schools, talk to the admission officers. What are they offering? Sometimes they offer you scholarships because you are applying up to certain day, they can give you 15,000. 
if you apply by February, there will be 10,000. It, it keeps going down to 12,000 and then 10,000. So know those times and know how long you have to apply to obtain the maximum uh, benefit uh, or the maximum grants that the school offer for you. Okay, but you have a work study. You might not be interested in work study, you might, but just in case you can select that you're interested in work study where you can work at school at the campus and you are awarded that money through is the federal work study. So it's a grant. I'm sorry, it's not a grant. You're this funding, the federal funding and you work on that one. OK, so what does your awards letter includes? Include scholarship and grants, as we mentioned, work study, federal student loans and and yeah, you may not say the loans are federal aid or, or the type of aid that you want, but they are good because of the repayment terms. If you do not have additional funding to pay, federal loans is an excellent option for you. Then you have private loans. Now every school, some schools offer private loans, some of them refer you to some private lenders, but it also should be private student loans. And what is important when you receive your award letter, make sure that you read it so you know the conditions of every award. For example, for federal loans, you have to be at least attending at least six credit hours for some schools. For some scholarships, you need to be full time. And if you withdraw or drop, you may lose part of that scholarship. The same for the Pell Grant. We can go to the next slide. So just make sure to read your award letter carefully. Well, there we go. Number one, read the award letter fully. There are important details through the letter, throughout the letter. Know the total cost of attendance. Subtract and work study, loan and work study amounts from the total aid to know what your true gap is. So the gap will be how much are your charges minus how much is your aid, and then you know how much you owe. So don't just accept loans or only do it if you need it because you need to repay them. Even though they have excellent repayment terms, it's still a loan. You still need to pay it. And some of these loans have interest if, while you're in the school. If your letter provides annual amount, remember to split that in half. And your award letter will say how much for fall, how much for spring. If you are taking loans, remember that is the gross amount. The net amount, the lender, which is the Department of Education, will um, will take some origination fees. Not that much, but they will take it. So that will be your net amount. And then confirm the scholarship amount, if applicable, will be split in half. It will be renewable or if only given once. So that's questions for your financial aid office. Some of them can be renewable. Some of them don't have to, but they will let you know. And don't forget to accept it by following the instructions. Either you sign the award letter or you accept it online but you always have the right to accept or decline um, loans if you don't want them or any other aid. Next slide, please. How to maintain financial aid this year? So every year, the, so we, the federal aid is from the federal government, so they have their regulations. They want to make sure you are successful, especially if you're borrowing money, this is for everybody, where you're borrowing money or using Pell Grants or whatever scholarship you're using. They want to make sure you're successful and that you're not getting into debt or you are not, mis not using your grants uh, effectively because even your Pell Grants have an expiration. You can only use it for certain times. And so what they do, they help, this, they help you and they help the school by measuring what is your academic process, progress? Now the financial academic progress, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, your satisfactory academic progress through financial aid might be different than the academic part. So we measure your cumulative GPA. So what that means, we measure by the end of the spring semester, we're gonna measure fall and spring. So you may have a bad fall, but an excellent spring, we put them all together, which is not this important. Everybody have issues and you may not be done do well in one class. You may have gotten a, a non-passing grade. It's always good for you to retake that class again as soon as you can. So it cannot be being counted and keep bringing your GPA, which is your grade point average, bring it down. So what else do we measure? We measure 
completion, meaning how many classes you enroll. Let's say you enroll in 12 credit hours and how many you complete. You need to be at 67% to be considered eligible. So what happens if you're not eligible? The school will work with you for you to regain eligibility. But always make sure that not to withdraw from classes and to have your passing grades because that's going to be measured for your financial aid. So complete your FASA. That's the second uh, bullet. Uh, it opens today and early submission is strongly encouraged. And as I mentioned before, uh, complete the, SSS, the CSS profile if your institution requires it. And if you're receiving DC TAC, reapply. Or if you're receiving any other DC scholarships, it's just not DC TAC. You have DC CAP, you have DC majors. You know, check with your high school, uh, with the counselor. They can give you any more information about this and even help you, uh, help you fill, this, fill these applications out. So there's, you live in DC, there are three scholarships. It opens about uh, around February 1st. Next slide, please. So scholarships. So what are we going to say about scholarships? You have, it is not fun, but it can be made good if you learn how to do your scholarships. Uh, you need to apply. Don't think you cannot receive it unless you're not going to apply. For sure, you're not going to get any scholarship. So you need to make sure you're applying. So it's going to be, you need to write essays, but you can save those essays and reduce and use them again uh, for other, for other uh, scholarships. So don't just apply for private scholarships. Go ahead and apply for different scholarships. Uh, there is a great website called, called fastweb.com. That's a website that is actually recommended by, by the federal government, schools. It's a safe website. Just put all your information in there and they give you uh, different scholarship information every week. Uh, apply. It's not bad to apply for too many scholarships. The more, the better. Not following application instructions, not paying attention to deadlines. That's key. Waiting too long to search for scholarships. So the moment to apply for the scholarships is now. And if you, for, if you have um, brothers and sisters that, is, that are now in their uh, juniors, they can apply to as well, not just, not just yourself. So that's what the more you apply. I've seen scholarships from churches for 250, from 500, from different things. So just look for them. They are there, they are available. You just need to apply. Okay, and good luck with that part. Next slide, please. So scholarships part two. The scholarships are always available to keep applying. To sign up for DC PS Dollars for College newsletter, please go to the link that is on the screen and I'm sure they're going to uh, send it to you as well. That's very important and follow the instructions. Don't, th th don't assume. A lot of people that I see as students, this, they're new to the process. And they said, no, this is not going to be for me. Or no, I don't have the information. You don't know, ask questions. We are here to help you. Everywhere and every agency is here to help you. Your school, wherever you're applying, apply early. Even if you apply from more than one school, just go ahead and do, and then you have to review those award letters that you're getting and see what's more convenient with you. Go back and ask and say, hey, is there anything else that I can get? Um, this is my situation. Sometimes you do need to tell them what it is so they can help to search for more. Make sure you understand the scholarship requirements fully. Not all scholarships are renewable each year of college. Some require you to resubmit your application in order to receive again. Like DC scholarships, like the Pell Grants, you need to do a FASA every award year. So just put it in your calendar. You know, some require to maintain a minimum GPA in order to receive the scholarship again or to have certain number of grades that you're enrolled. So know all those facts so you, so you know. And use your calendar. I tell students, October should be where you always fill out your FASA, uh, put it somewhere. And the good thing with the FASA is that you can renew it. So you may do all the hard work now, but next year you can just renew it or all the information will transfer. So it will be easier for you to do it and for your parents, okay? So are there any questions for us? Perfect. 
Thank you so much, Martha. Thank um, you. Karime may be able to answer some questions, but may have to step off to pick up her son. And so we are going to transition as best as possible, and we may have um, a couple of people from the College and Career team joining us today. Um, so I think I'm not sure who can answer this question, whether it's Karime or Martha, but there was a question on just DC TAG, um, which is the DC Tuition Assistance Grant. Are there any limitations for schools or using that for FAFSA um, that parents should know? And then the other piece is thinking about what schools or how do you find information about schools that have um, in-state tuition for DC residents or how does that work for um, for applying for schools? I'm not sure I can put this question to whether it's Karime or Martha. I can take the second part of the question. Uh, so let's start there and then hopefully uh, Martha can also help in. Uh, so I think a good starting, I, let's just first um, take a step back and think about where it might be a good starting point to learn about colleges. Uh, and at DCPS, you can start doing your own research by using Naviance and logging in to learn about all the different colleges that are available in the nation. Um, and as far as in-state tuition, um, I would say, generally speaking, it is important that you know the distinction um, between a private college um, and an in-state or, or public institution. So private colleges, generally speaking, across the country, um, will not charge different tuition rates based on residency. So an example of a local private college could be like George uh, Washington University, Trinity Washington, uh, Georgetown. Those institutions do not uh, have different rates in tuition. Um, it is the same rate regardless of whether you are a local student or not. So generally speaking, private universities just have one type of tuition cost. Public institutions, um, because are funded through their own states, those institutions will have DC or will have, sorry, in-state tuition rates and out-of-state tuition rates. Um, and so I think that's also important if you're looking to know if you're looking at colleges in Maryland, Virginia, Delaware, there might be institutions um, who make an exemption for DC residents and who will not have different a different cost. You can also look at uh, through the Aussie website and look at, you know, through DC tag. Uh, institutions that are uh, the qualify for for the funds available as well to help lower the cost of tuition or the cost of attendance. Um, Martha, do you have other recommendations? You are muted. I'm sorry. I was going to say that I'm glad that you think the second part of the question because I, I can answer the first part. <laughs> so the first part is that the, the DC tag is the tuition um, assistance grant, it means that it will only help you with tuition. So you can get a lot of scholarships, but you need to know the DC tag, the money that you're going to get is only going to go for tuition. So it's important for you to look at the scholarships that you're receiving. What are they being used for? It will tell you this is for cost of living, cost of attendance, or it's for tuition only. So if your, if your tuition is 15,000 and you have $20,000 in scholarships that are going to go all of them for tuition, then you're going to have to select which one you don't want because we need, we will need to return part of that money. So yeah, so, so DC tag is only for tuition and it will be applied for tuition. If you do have grants and loans and then DC tag, then you, and it exceeds, exceeds uh, the charges, then yes, you can get uh, any credit balances from other scholarships because this tax is only being applied apply for tuition. So that's something you might want to look when you're applying to scholarships. Well, 
when you're receiving them to see what it's going to cover. Thank you. We have about two more questions, so we might go over a little bit of time. But with, uh, I think this question is for Karime, more on for parents and students, who should they connect with at their school and information about applying for financial aid um, or even just doing one on one tutorials because it could be um, a little overwhelming for um, for parents taking this on. So who would you suggest that they connect with and what supports will there will be offered for students and parents? Absolutely. I think as Martha said, the first and most important thing is that you need to realize that you are not alone and we are here to help. Colleges in the area are here to help the financial aid offices from the colleges in the area if you're considering attending that college. But even if you're not sure, they can help answer a lot of those questions. This is why we're joined by Martha today because she's committed and interested in supporting students through the financial aid process. Um, and us in the college prep team can also be an excellent resource. Now, within your own schools, your high school counselors and also your college and career coordinators are definitely those experts that can help uh, guide you through the process. You may also be at a high school that has a DC CAP, a DC CAP officer, and our DC CAP um, staff members that are in some of your schools are really sort of charged with really helping your child and you as the parent through this financial aid process, similar to how you have a counselor supporting primarily the college admissions process, your DC cap advisors help through the financial aid process. But the help is out there, so if you don't know where to start, um, you can always use the college prep team as a first starting point. We can always point you into the right direction. I'm sure Noah is going to send the college prep team email, um, but we'll be also happy to connect you with anyone. Also, we are launching, as I mentioned at the beginning, at the beginning of the presentation, we are going to be launching a text messaging campaign for all of our parents in the district. Um, you know, with the kickoff of this presentation, we are going to be sending reminders um, to our parents around the FAFSA and tips in the coming months. And at the uh, towards the end of this month on October 26, we have um, tentatively held uh, the, the date on the calendar to offer to offer um, this sort of one on one support for FAFSA as you begin to fill out the form. Um, and so we will be following up with information uh, with all of our attendees on these office hours. So if you are interested or you find yourself in need of help, we will have volunteers, we will have counselors, college and career coordinators, and a team of folks behind the scenes um, ready to support and help any of our parents who may um, be in need of of that and that's only going to be the beginning that's only for you know this month and the coming months we will continue to have events supports and resources um, until we get through the finish line of the college application cycle thank you so much Karime. i just wanted to make sure that you were able to plug that in before you had to leave um thank and you. i do want to finish may off I add something question. quickly would you mind yeah go for it um yeah I just wanted to say that for the students and their parents, sometimes you may think that your situation is unique. You'll be surprised. We hear different types of situations, not just income, but also with family. So don't be afraid to ask. We have been able to help a lot of people, and I'm sure different schools, they're all waiting for you to help you as well. Just let them know what your needs are. But if not, you can work also with your um, counselors here. So just want to make sure to it's not just money, but also the situations that we can take into account. Um, just let us know. Okay. Awesome. I think we're going to close out there just for timing purposes. But if you do have additional questions for the college and career team, and if we weren't able to answer your questions, I believe there should be um, an email in the announcements. You can reach out to ccp at k12.dc.gov 
for additional questions that we may have not answered today. But I do want to plug that we have upcoming parent university workshops, especially with college and the college and career team with college admissions 101 next week, and then the following week supporting students to and through college. And then on October 22nd, we do have bullying prevention and you can sign up at bit.ly ly backslash DCPS parent U RSVP. And then for wrapping up, we have um, we finished our 10 session series for DCPS reopen strong. And so if you need additional resources, especially for upcoming term two announcements, we recommend that you visit DCPS reopen strong.com and that will have additional information as well as all of the past parent you presentations for reopen strong. And then for today, if you can let us know how we did by going to our eval online eval at bit.ly backslash parent you eval 19 and completing a quick survey. And then for just general questions about parent university sessions and things that you want to look out for the coming months, go ahead, email us at parent you at k12.dc.gov. And um, to catch this session, you can go to bit.ly backslash DCPS parent you vids on YouTube. Um, and you can just put that into your phone or into your computer and that would directly take you to the recorded session today. And so check out that session as well as our sessions from the spring um, if you wanted to learn more about parent university workshops. And with that, I want to thank Karime and Martha for taking their time today to present and answer questions. And um, thank you, everyone have a good evening and stay dry if it does rain today. <laughs>